What is going on, everybody? This is Johnny with Sierra Whiskey Co., and today we're talking optics. How do you tell what are the best binoculars for your given situation? Which binoculars for which task? Chromatic aberration? Inner pupillary distance? Exit pupil? What do all these damn terms mean? Having the right information will allow you to select the correct set of binoculars for your task and can make all the difference in having an enjoyable experience. Whether that's for birding, scouting, hunting, a sporting event, or even reconnaissance. Some, if not most manufacturers at one time or another, have done some funny math in order to try and trick the end user as well as misrepresenting information or even hiding true specifications for the sake of the sale. Liar! By the end of this series, you should have the know-how to select not only the correct optic for your uses, but also how to tell the difference between marketing hype and reality. You all seem to really enjoy the optics content, so we're going to be covering binoculars now. But first, we're going to start with education on some general terms and principles that will lend themselves in helping you to evaluate all optics for your purposes. Whether that be spotting scopes, rifle scopes, monoculars, or in this case, binoculars. This is a small section of a lecture I've given at the Range Master Tactical Conference. That particular lecture is a few hours long, so we're going to carve this out. It's a little easier to digest. Good information on optics in the not-too-distant past was very difficult to find, if not impossible. What little there was available usually wasn't great, or it was rather shallow. That's gotten better, but it's still not great, so hopefully this series changes that. What is a binocular and the different types? Let's start simple with what is a binocular. Effectively, it's two parallel, low-power telescopes that allow for a more dynamic three-dimensional view. These will be connected by a hinge or hinges. If you have two hinges, it's an open bridge design, and if you have one large hinge, it's referred to as a closed bridge or sometimes a standard bridge. What are its two basic functions? Well, one, to enlarge or magnify the image of what you're looking at. This allows us to gather more and hopefully better information. Two, to gather more light than the human eye does. There are two basic designs. One is the roof prism binocular, which are the most commonly seen type these days, and they have the inline design of the prisms. These used to be much less common, but the advancements in technology have changed that, making them more affordable. Next would be the poroprism design. Just think the 80s and 90s action movie type binocular. These have the prism slightly offset, so they tend to be significantly wider. There are also some other types as far as function and features go. You'll see binoculars with a physical reticle in them. This aids in a more traditional means of measurement for military situations, or perhaps sport shooting. Then you have your range-finding binocular. Just like it sounds, these use a laser to determine distance. Uh, you'll now find them with ballistic suites added into the unit themselves, but keep in mind the more bells and whistles, the higher the cost. Currently, these will have a bluish or greenish tint on the glass, which is a necessary evil for the display to function properly. There are also image-stabilized binoculars. Historically, these are more expensive, and with more technology, you have more things to go wrong. So for hard use, take that into consideration. Let's discuss the performance gap and talk the big three. These companies used to be considered uh, the big three due to their dominance in the market, their reputation for quality and innovation, and also the significant contributions to the field of optics and imaging. First, we have Zeiss. Founded in 1846 in Jena, Germany, Zeiss was one of the largest and most renowned optical companies in the world, known for their high quality lenses and precision instruments. 
If you've ever been to an optometrist, you've likely seen some very fancy machinery with a Zeiss logo on it. Second is Leica. Established in 1914 in Wetzlar, Germany, Leica was a leading producer of cameras, binoculars, and microscopes, also renowned for their compact, high-quality optics and innovative designs. And last but not least, we have Nikon. They were founded in 1917 in Tokyo, Japan. Nikon is one of the largest and most well-known optical companies in the world. They're known for their cameras, their binoculars, and also microscopes. If you wanted good performance, you needed to go with the big three. That has changed over the years, and now whomever has enough money to play the game can put out some excellent optics. This is because most of the companies are having their items manufactured by third-party overseas companies, and if not, a fair amount of their components are. Some optics may be assembled here or partially assembled here. There's a certain percentage of the work that needs to be done here in the United States to say, made in U.S. You typically aren't going to find many optics that are 100% U.S. made, and that's not just because the glass is made elsewhere. Keep in mind, not all manufacturers are honest about this. Liar! There's not a lot of regulation, and if there is, not much oversight to it. I've heard tales of people going to Asian factories and seeing made-in-Germany optics sitting there. Now, I have no proof of this, and this is possibly second or third hand. It's possible that these were just a lot of samples sitting there, but it does make you wonder. The proof really is in the pudding, and that's why it's important to base your decision on performance. Let's cover the main parts of the binocular. You have the eye cups, which usually twist out to lengthen these days. This helps with indexing for eye relief. Your ocular lenses, which are the ones you look into. The focus wheel, located in the center of the binocular, which will adjust focus for both barrels. The objective lenses are the ones that face away from you. The hinge, which connects the two barrels and holds them in the proper alignment. The tripod adapter threads, which are located in the end of the hinge. Let's cover some terms. We're going to cover a fair amount of terms and some concepts so you have the knowledge and the vocabulary to evaluate optics. We'll start with field of view. This refers to the area that is visible when looking through the optic. You will commonly see the abbreviation FOV referring to this. There are two ways the field of view is typically specified, angular and linear. Angular field of view will be expressed in degrees, whereas linear field of view will be expressed as a width, usually in feet or meters at a given distance. Usually with binoculars, the field of view is going to be a distance of 1,000 yards. For example, 420 feet at 1,000 yards. The greater your field of view, the more you can see. However, depending on your use case, that's not always the best thing, but we'll get to that later when we cover best form factor for a given purpose. An increase of magnification equates to a field of view decrease as well as a decrease in eye relief. The opposite is also true. If you're only given one specification and want to convert it to the other, that's pretty simple and involves a little math. If you want to convert angular field of view to linear field of view in feet at 1,000 yards, your linear field will equal your angular field times 52.5. Let's say your angular field is eight degrees, We'd multiply that by 52.5, and we would get 420 feet at 1,000 yards, just as our prior example. That 52.5 figure is actually an industry approximation. One degree is going to equal 52.365 feet. Let's now say that we want to convert that angular field of view to meters. We would use this formula. Linear field is equal to our angular field times 17.5. For our eight degree field, that would be 140 meters at 1,000 meters distance. Obviously, these formulas can be used to find the angular field of view if only the linear is given. On to eye relief. 
This is how far away the eye has to be from the ocular lens in order to see the full field of view. If you wear eyeglasses, this can sometimes be a problem when selecting binoculars. You want to make sure you have enough eye relief to allow you an optimal view, generally speaking around 16 to 20 millimeters. You should see the eye relief given in the manufacturer's specifications. That'll be in millimeters for binoculars. It's usually best if you do wear eyeglasses to use the binoculars without them, if at all possible. Otherwise, you'll experience some peripheral light loss. If you don't wear eyeglasses, your binoculars should have eye cups that are adjustable, which allow you to twist them out in a corkscrew fashion at different index points. This will allow for you to put the binoculars up to your eye and have the right eye relief distance set so you have an immediate full field of view. If you have the binoculars on hand and you don't know the eye relief specs, you can do the following test to find that out. Place the optics on a flat surface and shine a flashlight through the objective end. You can then take an index card and move it forward and aft of the ocular lens until the light shining through the optic is at its smallest and clearest point. Measure the distance from the card to the ocular lens and you have your eye relief. This test can also be done without the flashlight and using the sun as your light source. Optics, like binoculars, are purged with inert gases to prevent the formation of internal fog or moisture that can impair their performance and longevity. This is done by filling the internal chamber with a dry, non-reactive gas, such as nitrogen or argon, to displace air and create a dry environment. By removing the air and moisture, the internal optics are protected from moisture-related issues, such as corrosion, mold, and fungus growth. This helps to maintain the clarity of the lenses and ensure the binoculars continue to perform well even in humid or wet conditions. You'll see people argue online about which is better, argon or nitrogen. In theory, argon is better because it's a larger molecule and it won't leak out as easily as nitrogen. However, what really matters here is the O-rings that prevent the gas from leaking out. If you do have a leak, you'll see condensation on the inside of the binoculars. In the vast majority of instances, when they are repaired, they're going to use nitrogen to repurge it anyway. That brings us to waterproofing, or sometimes you'll see it marketed as weatherproof or water resistant. Some other amusing terms you may see, fogproof, moisture resistant, splashproof, sprayproof, rainproof, and best of all, showerproof. I frequently use my binos in the shower to see my extremely small peen- uh, Typically, weatherproof is a nice way of saying your binos may hold up okay in rain, but can't be submerged. To be sure, you want to see an actual waterproofing rating. The rating system typically used in the US and Europe is the IPX system. IPX being a representation of the phrase ingress protection. The system is tiered in terms of the level of protection against water. It is as follows. IPX0 offers no protection against water. IPX1, protected against dripping water. IPX2, protected against dripping water when tilted up to 15 degrees. IPX3, protected against water spray. IPX4, protected against splashes of water from any direction. IPX5, protected against water jets. IPX6, protected against heavy seas or powerful water jets. IPX7, this is the one you're going to see most commonly. That means it's protected against immersion in water for up to 30 minutes at a depth of 1 meter. IPX8, protected against continuous immersion in water for specified pressure and time. The depth and duration is going to be specified by the manufacturer. I highly recommend something IPX7 or better. Something that is weatherproof leaves a lot of room for interpretation and could be anything from around IPX1 to IPX4. So when shopping for waterproof binoculars, it's important to consider the IPX rating and make sure it meets your needs and requirements for protection against water. A quick note, 
If you had binos from the 1980s or 90s, it would likely carry a Japanese industrial standards rating like JIS-7, which is submersion in one meter of water for five minutes without leaking. This was the standard because most binos and spotters used to be made in Japan. Light transmission in binoculars refers to the percentage of light that passes through the binoculars and reaches the user's eyes. A higher light transmission means a brighter and clearer image. Manufacturers determine the light transmission by measuring the amount of light entering the binoculars and the amount of light reaching the eyepiece. The companies can use different methods to manipulate the light transmission numbers to show a more favorable result. Liar. For example, they can measure the light transmission of the binoculars without accounting for the light loss due to reflection from the lenses. This can result in an overestimation of the actual light transmission. Additionally, they can use lower quality prisms or coatings that reduce the light transmission but increase the contrast and color rendering. This can affect the overall image quality. Therefore, it's important for consumers to be aware of these practices and to carefully evaluate the specifications and reviews of binoculars before making a purchase. Resolution in binoculars refers to the ability of the binoculars to distinguish fine details in an object and the sharpness of those details. This is determined by the number of optical elements, that is, lenses and prisms, and their quality, as well as the size of the objective lenses. The larger the objective lens, the higher the resolution, if all else is equal. The higher the resolution, the clearer and sharper the image will appear. To give you an idea of how this is measured and some more context, I'm going to introduce some units of measurement that you likely haven't heard of. They are arc minutes and arc seconds. We're all familiar with degrees, as in there are 360 degrees in a full rotation. Well, an arc minute is also an angular unit of measurement and is equal to 1 60th of one degree. Just as there are 60 seconds in a minute, so too are there 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. Therefore, an arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute. This also means that an arc second is equal to 1 hundredth of one degree. Resolution is measured in seconds or minutes of arc. The smaller the number, the better the resolution. Now this might seem a bit odd at first, but with this next piece of information, it may make a bit more sense. The measurement is effectively telling us the smallest angle that can be distinguished between two objects. The human eye has a resolving power of about one to two minutes, or stated another way, it can distinguish between objects that are separated by an angle of one to two arc minutes. In low light conditions, that ability is going to degrade to about four or five arc minutes. A binocular with a 50 millimeter objective is going to have approximately 2.3 seconds of arc, which is a huge difference compared to the eye. It's 60 to 120 seconds versus 2.3 seconds. In order to find the theoretical resolution in seconds of arc for a binocular, we can use a simple formula. Resolution is going to equal 116 divided by the objective diameter in millimeters. You can also use a resolution chart, such as the USAF 1951 chart, in order to gauge resolution. Though, if you don't have a chart, you can use any piece of currency, pending it doesn't have wrinkles, folds, or creases in it. Affix it to a flat surface and try and resolve various areas of the currency. Then you can compare products to see if they will resolve similarly. Keep in mind, these resolutions are theoretical as it's the sum of many things that determine optical performance, quality, components, alignment, collimation, atmospheric conditions, and even your own eyesight all play a role here. Contrast refers to the difference in brightness between the lightest and the darkest areas of an image. When referring to binoculars, higher contrast means 
the differences in brightness between the objects in the image will be more pronounced, which results in a more vivid and detailed image. Contrast can be affected by several factors, including the quality of the lenses and coatings, the type of prism used, and the amount of light transmitted through the binoculars. Binoculars with high quality lenses and coatings and with prisms that effectively manage light transmission tend to have higher contrast and therefore better performance. A lower contrast image can make it harder to distinguish between objects, especially in low light conditions. This can result in a less clear and detailed image and make it more difficult to see objects accurately. In summary, Contrast is an important factor to consider when evaluating the performance of binoculars, as higher contrast generally results in a clearer and more vivid image. Near or close focus should be listed in the specifications of your optic. This is the closest possible distance in which it is useful and in sharp focus. Anything closer will be out of focus. If you are older, your eyes age, that distance may be a little further out than stated. If you wear contacts or glasses, this can also have an impact on the listed specification. Close focus is usually not a huge deal for hunters or military personnel, but for those who are birders or like to observe insects, it can matter more. Depth of field will be the distance between the objects that are in focus in your field of view. Think of the direction of where you're looking as a sliced loaf of bread extending out in front of you. Each slice is a cross section of that space. Perhaps you can see slices four through eight in your current field of view, but only slices five, six, and seven are in focus. Those slices will define your depth of field. As you look further out, the distance you're looking increases. So too does the depth of field. The converse is also true. You may be able to see slices one through three, but only slice one will be in focus. Here, we'll cover in greater depth the topic of prisms. We've already learned that there are two main types, poro prism binoculars and roof prism binoculars, sometimes referred to as Dach prism. That's D-A-C-H. The roof prism design has the straight optical barrel, whereas the poro will have a more offset or zigzag look. The roof prism design is more compact and lighter weight. They are more complex and require more precise tolerances, which make them more difficult to manufacture. So poro prism can be a little cheaper, and they used to be touted for their better optical quality. With the more recent technological advances, roof prism binoculars are on par with poro prisms as long as they are phase corrected and have dielectric coatings on the prisms. That is, if all else is equal. The previously mentioned terms are more in regards to the shape and the layout of the prisms. There's more to it than just that. There are also different styles of prisms. The BK7 and the BAK4. Both are composed of high-quality borosilicate glass. However, barium oxide is used as an additive in the BAK-4s. This increases the density of the glass, which helps to reduce the internal light scattering during transmission to the eye. Therefore, the BK-7 will have more internal light scattering, which will result in lower optical quality and lower brightness. Now, some manufacturers will tell you the style of prism used, but even the ones that do will not let on to the level of quality. There is a spectrum of performance, and that cat will not be let out of the bag. If you're unsure of what style of prism was used, and the manufacturer doesn't tell you, hold the binos up to a bright light source, but not up to your eyes, and look at the light cone coming through. The edges of the light cone will be clipped on the BK7s. It will present as a diamond shape. The BAK-4s will not have this as the whole light cone will be visible. In some instances, the BAK-4s will have a little edge clipping on a side, but that's typically only seen if the prisms are undersized for the design. 
since the BAK4 prisms are higher density and thereby higher performance, they're heavier and more expensive, leading to a more costly binocular overall. This topic is a real rabbit hole, but that's enough information to make it dangerous. Brightness of an optical image is going to be composed of a few things. One, the objective lens size and magnification, that is your exit pupil. Two, the optical coatings. Three, the intensity of the light being projected or reflected your way from the image. Four, the light that is lost when moving through the optical system. There are several indices used to define brightness in the optical game, but there are inherent limitations that are beyond the scope of what I'd like to cover. Translation, it's just too nerdy and really not all that useful. We're already going pretty deep, but I will mention them if you want to do some independent research. They are the Relative Brightness Index, Twilight Factor Index, and Relative Light Efficiency Index. This video is sponsored by, well, us. If you like what you're seeing, please like and share this video with friends and subscribe to the channel. On a channel like ours, it really does help. YouTube is not a big fan of some of the stuff we put out. It's easy to see when one of the videos we put out, which is on a really cool and useful topic, has only 300 views, and another one has well over 300,000 views. Use code BINOVID20, that's B-I-N-O-V-I-D-2-0, for 20% off all products on our website. Use code BINOVID20, that's B-I-N-O-V-I-D-2-0, for 20% off all our products on our website. The more purchases you make, the more money we have to do cool videos. So, hopefully you enjoy the content and you enjoy our products. We're gonna go over aberrations, and these are the unwelcome things that make performance less good. First, we'll start with chromatic aberration. You'll often hear this referred to as CA. It is the failure to bring light of different wavelengths, that is, the colors, to a common focus, or in other words, it's a distortion. So what does that look like to the end user? A faint colored halo will be present. It's gonna appear as blue or yellow, though at times it could be red or green, depending on the optical system and the situation. Now, you'll be able to see this along the edge of telephone wires, the lines of buildings or roofs, uh, bright stars, the moon, pretty much any dark object against a bright sky. Now, it usually appears along the edge, but it is most certainly throughout the full field. And when present, it's going to reduce color saturation, contrast, and resolution. If you want to evaluate an optical system more thoroughly, you can source and use a test chart. Another aberration is distortion. This appears when the magnification of the lens is not consistent from the center of the field of view to the edges. Binos, spotting scopes, and rifle scopes all suffer from the same type of distortion called rectilinear, of which there are two subtypes, barrel and pincushion. One of the easiest ways to spot this and determine which type of distortion it is, is to look at a brick wall or the edge of a building or a telephone wire. Anything large and straight enough to cover the entire field of view. If the lines bend or curve outward, this is pincushion distortion. And that means that the closer to the edge of the field of view, the magnification is increasing. The opposite is true for barrel distortion. The lines will curve inward. Think like an old timey wooden barrel. So as you move off the optical axis, the magnification is decreasing. The next type of distortion is field curvature, sometimes referred to as flatness of field. This means that the light rays aren't all coming into focus in the same plane, and this manifests as the center of your optical image being in focus, and then it moving to out of focus as you approach the edge. The opposite can also be true. Low to mid-tier optics will sometimes have a fair amount of field curvature, 
but most high-end optics will usually have extra flattener lenses in the objective or ocular lenses or both. A friend once told me a tale of a company making a field flattener so good, it was actually making people feel sick because their brain expected some kind of distortion. It was just too perfect. So they had to make the design optically less good so it didn't make people feel queasy. And that's kind of crazy. The last type of distortion we'll cover is in relation to collimation, or otherly worded, alignment. This is likely going to be the biggest issue you'll face. If your binoculars are out of collimation or decollimated, that means the optical axes of the barrels are mechanically misaligned. This not only can cause image issues, it can make you feel physically ill, cause eye strain, headaches, and nausea can result from this. A large portion of cheaper binoculars can have collimation issues out of the box, but most consumers never notice because their eyes tend to compensate for the misalignment. Your binos can also be knocked out of collimation during shipping or from rough handling. If you drop them out of a tree stand, it's highly possible they'll be out of collimation. It's most obvious when you look through and see a double image or an odd ghosting of the image. That's a dead giveaway. Though it can be less obvious, and here are a couple ways to tell. Test 1. The book test. Focus on an object through the binos at about 100 yards or further away. Have someone hold a book or whatever in front of one of the objectives. Make sure to keep both eyes open. Once your eyes are acclimated, have the person pull the book away very quickly. If you see two images that meld into one, the binos are out of collimation. Test two, the pullout test. That's right for the plucking. Leave your jokes in the comment section. Look at the top of a flat building or a roof at a distance with both eyes open. Pull the binoculars away from your face slowly to about a foot. Your view should be the same. If you see the view switch to two views, you're out of collimation. If you see one image higher than the other, it's a vertical collimation issue, which tends to be more common. And if one image is differently framed from side to side, it's going to be a horizontal collimation issue. If you have any collimation issue, I've said that a lot already, you need to send it in for repairs, most likely to the manufacturer, and they will use a, get this, collimator to bring them back into collimation. It's a big, expensive machine, so don't try and redneck engineer it and fix it yourself. It's not worth the time and effort. Adjustment and operation. Binoculars have few but important controls. We'll cover those now. Your binos are going to have a central hinge or hinges in some cases, which allow you to adjust the barrels of them to the width of your eyes, or more precisely, your pupils. This distance is called the interpupillary distance. You'll often see the acronym IPD used for this. This distance varies from person to person, and depending on how close or far apart your eyes are set, you may not be able to use all models on the market. The measurement is usually between 50 to 75 millimeters. These specifications should be posted on the manufacturer's website. If not, I would recommend reaching out to them. The larger the objective lens of the binocular, the wider the low end of the IPD range is, at least when the objective lens reaches a large enough size. So if you have close set eyes like I do, you may not be able to use a high magnification bino that's intended purpose is for glassing off of tripods. It's just not possible to get the barrels close enough together to allow you to see through both of them at once. The converse can also be true. If you have very wide set eyes, a smaller binocular may not adjust wide enough for you. In order to adjust for your IPD, you need only move the two halves of the binocular until you see one clear and circular image. Quite a few people think that you can just pick up a set of binos and just start using them, but this isn't the case. They basically need to be tuned to your vision. That's why you'll find other than the center focus wheel, your set of binoculars is likely going to have a diopter ring, most commonly on the right barrel. The diopter and center focus wheel are going to let you make sure that each barrel of the binocular 
is appropriately focused to the corresponding eye to account for vision differences per eye. Now, there are some older or less common models, and they may differ from what I'm about to tell you, but they've become increasingly rare, so we won't cover them here. If you have a range-finding binocular, you're likely going to have two diopters. One will be for the focus of the particular barrel, and the other will be for the range-finding reticle and bringing that into focus. In order to properly set these up for your vision, choose an object to focus on 20 to 25 yards away. It can be a blade of grass, a leaf, or perhaps even a resolution chart. Whatever it is, just be sure to use the same object for each eye and also make sure it has enough detail for you to notice the level of focus. Look at the object, close your right eye, and use the center focus wheel to adjust until the object is the most focused you can make it. Then you're going to look through your right eye only and use the diopter ring to adjust until you have the object in the best possible focus. The diopter ring may lock depending on the model, so you may have to pull it up to make adjustments. When finished, open both eyes and verify the object is in a nice, crisp focus. Some diopter rings are labeled with how much magnification they're adding or subtracting. You can make a note of this or put a witness mark on it, but I usually abstain from that. It's not uncommon for your vision to change over time, and this process should take 30 seconds, maybe a minute, once you know what you're doing. There are quite a few brands with locking diopters that have click adjustments or increments. These aren't always the best because oftentimes the image is most sharp when you're between increments and the diopter won't allow you to leave it there when locking. It's something to consider. Glass. Typically, the better the glass, the more money and the better the performance. Let's get nerdy and learn more about glass and how to evaluate it. First, we need to know about dispersion. White light is composed of all of the colors in the color spectrum. When you pass light through a prism, it breaks up the white light into its colored components. Think Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon album cover. The prism distributes the light, and the measure of how much of those colors are spread out is referred to as dispersion in this context. Every part of an optical system is actually really, really important. But optical coatings are of major importance. They reduce glare, reduce light loss due to reflection, increase light transmission, brightness, and contrast. You can have an amazing optical system with amazing glass, and if your coatings suck, the binoculars will be perhaps okay. In a binocular, you may have as many as 16 different glass surfaces. Each one of those surfaces if they weren't coated, can reflect about 4 or 5% of the light. Perhaps 50% or more of the light would be lost before it can reach your eye. The light scattering and bouncing around would also cause glare issues or image ghosting issues. Seeing as how important these coatings are, let's go over the different types and levels of them. These coatings are typically of a very thin metal like magnesium fluoride, or titanium dioxide. This takes that 4 to 5% of light reflection per surface and reduces it down to about 1 to 2%. Adding other materials and additional layers of coatings can bring this down further to as little as 0.2% per surface. Buyer beware. Don't pay attention to published light transmission specs as there is no industry standard. Manufacturers will play tricks by telling you the light transmission of only one surface of glass, not the whole optical system. They'll also do something like tell you the transmission of a particular color and lead you to believe that is for the whole color spectrum. Liar. You may also notice a binocular selling for a couple hundred dollars that has the same advertised light transmission of 90 something percent as one that costs thousands of dollars. How can this be? It can't. It's marketing, and they're trying to trick you into a sale. So unless you have a spectrophotometer or monochromator, you have no way of knowing. Therefore, ignore what's advertised. It's usually bunk. 
Now, it's not so much how many layers of what's being applied, but more what is being applied and how dense and uniform these coatings are. The right coatings applied the wrong way will cause very poor optical performance. Companies are going to be super duper hush hush about the coatings, so don't expect them to tell you all about their secret sauce. In fact, a lot of information in optics is hard to come by because the industry is full of secretive and proprietary information. If you look at the glass from different angles, you will see the color of the coatings, perhaps purple, green, violet, blue, or shifting in between these colors. The color of the coatings aren't going to tell you how good they are. Though, if you see a reddish or orangish coating, sometimes that's kind of the exception. These coatings typically come on low quality items and tend to give the image you are viewing a blue or green tint. So let's get into the types of coatings you'll usually see. First, coated optics, usually abbreviated as a C. At least one surface was coated with anti-reflective coating of one or more lenses. This is pretty vague. Next would be fully coated, abbreviated as FC. All air to glass surfaces have been coated. However, it could be less. This is also kind of vague. Next would be multi-coated which would be abbreviated as MC. One or more surfaces of one or more lenses have had multiple coatings applied, though some could be single coated or some with no coatings. Bit of a trend happening here. Next would be fully multi-coated, abbreviated as FMC. Means all air to glass layers have multiple coatings. There you have it, clear as mud. As promised, a bunch of marketing hype, and this can be very misleading. Your best bet, get fully multi-coated if you can afford it. That will be the best, but not all brands are created equal, and some don't mind bending the truth. The ocular and objective coatings have become quite advanced over the years, and now offer hydrophobic coatings that can resist scratching, oil, dust, and smudges, among other things. In terms of performance, the choice of glass will impact the clarity, color accuracy, and brightness of the image produced by the binoculars. Though I can't stress this enough, the whole optical system needs to be well designed and have the appropriate components to get the right performance. A Ferrari can't and won't perform to its full capability on the track with poor quality fuel and junk tires. Now, Types of glass. The first two types of glass we'll cover are called crown glass and flint glass. Crown glass has a high level of potassium oxide, around 10%. It is sometimes called soda lime glass due to it being composed of melted silica and, well, soda and lime. It tends to be more durable than flint glass, but is not as effective at correcting chromatic aberration. Flint glass, also known as lead glass, contains lead oxide and has a high refractive index, which makes it better for correcting chromatic aberration. Now, I know I said it contains lead oxide, but the concerns about lead being in it have caused the more modern manufacturing techniques to use titanium or zirconium dioxide in its stead. This glass is relatively soft and more prone to scratching, so it is often coated in magnesium fluoride. It tends to be more expensive than crown glass. This next glass is the creme de la creme of glass and is only used in some high-end models. And that's fluoride glass. Fluoride is fragile and difficult to manufacture, so it makes it very expensive and problematic for a large portion of manufacturers. The upside is that it almost completely eliminates chromatic aberration and provides a dramatic increase in contrast and resolution. Due to the aforementioned, you'll often find that only a limited number of elements in a particular design will use fluoride glass. It's a way for some companies to boost performance and either maintain or boost their profit margin. Moving on, we're going to cover ED glass. Let's see those jokes 
in the comments. This has very low dispersion, similar to that of fluorite glass, but not as good. You're going to find this in medium to higher end binoculars, and it will greatly reduce or nearly eliminate chromatic aberration. There are several grades of this glass and names associated with them. Sometimes it's hard to determine the marketing chaff from the performance wheat, and that's often the intention. Since good glass is good glass, there are other applications for these things, so you'll often see crossover with other optical instruments such as camera lenses. In order of least good performance to best performance of the following types, LD, SD, UD, SLD, and XD. First, LD, or low dispersion glass. LD glass is cost-effective and a solution for reducing chromatic aberration in binoculars. It provides a moderate level of performance and is commonly used in entry-level and mid-range binoculars. LD glass can be good for those who want improved image quality without breaking the bank. SD or special dispersion glass provides a higher level of chromatic aberration correction than LD glass, making it a good choice for mid-range to high-end binoculars. It is more expensive than LD glass, but is still affordable for many users. Third, we have UD glass, or ultra-low dispersion. UD glass is a high-end form of ED glass that provides excellent chromatic aberration correction. It's commonly used in professional-grade binoculars and is the industry standard for high-quality optics. UD glass is more expensive than LD and SD glass, but is worth the investment for those who demand the best image quality. Number four. SLD, or Special Low Dispersion Glass. It's a proprietary form of ED glass. It provides a level of chromatic aberration correction that is similar to UD glass, but may be slightly less expensive. SLD glass is commonly used in high-end applications. Lastly, XD glass. XD glass is proprietary and another form of ED glass. It provides the highest level of chromatic aberration correction of any ED glass, making it the best choice for users who demand the highest image quality. XD glass is used in the most advanced and most expensive applications. You will see terms like HD or UHD. The imparted meaning is that the glass is high density or ultra high density. Most people believe this means high definition. It does not. But the denser the glass, usually the higher the resolution and better the light transmission. Because there are, in effect, less air bubbles or other impurities that scatter the light or diffuse the image before it gets to your eye. Though you may see HD or UHD, these are more marketing terms than anything. It doesn't actually tell you if it's crown, flint, ED, or fluorite glass. So it may or may not be. Seeing those terms, you assume it's at the higher end of the scale, but it's difficult to tell. If you contact the company, it may be hard to get a straight answer. As time goes on, the marketing terms get so blurred with reality that oftentimes the people answering the questions have no idea, and perhaps only the project manager, engineer, or actual factory who produced it will know. Optical design. Magnification, often referred to as power, is basically stating the degree or level to which your image will be enlarged when looking through the optic versus looking with the naked eye. So, a 10 power binocular, which will be indicated by the number 10 followed by the letter X, indicating multiplication, will show you an image 10 times closer than the naked eye. You could also think of it another way the object as being one-tenth the actual distance. Something at 1,000 feet viewed through a 10x binocular would now appear to your eye as being 100 feet away. There are variable zoom binoculars that perform similar to a variable target scope, but these are somewhat rare, and some models even have switch magnification similar to the Elcan Spectre 1, 4, 
optic. These are also quite rare. The typical sentiment, as is with lots of things in the U.S., is, hell yes, more power, more better. I mean, come on. Higher mag means greater detail, closer viewing. What's not to like? But that's not always the case with optics. There are quite a few trade-offs we encounter with going up in magnification, especially in binoculars. The first, there'll be heavier and likely more difficult to hold steady. The second, the objective size may be larger due to this, meaning also more weight and more expense. Third, field of view decreases with magnification increase. More mag, less surrounding information. Fourth, higher magnification will also amplify your movement. You seem jittery. And fifth, your exit pupil will be smaller. Okay, so what the France is exit pupil? The exit pupil is an important aspect of binoculars, and it refers to the size of the circle of light that is visible when you look through the eyepiece. Technically speaking, it's the image of the light transmitted through the objective lens that is formed by the eyepiece. The size of the exit pupil is determined by the diameter of the objective lenses divided by the magnification of the binocular. For example, if you have a pair of binoculars that are 10 by 50 millimeters, the exit pupil would be 5 millimeters. That's 50 divided by 10. Here are some of the most common sizes and exit pupil specs for quick reference. 8 by 42 would be 5.25 millimeters. 10 by 42 would be 4.2 millimeters. As we already mentioned, 10 by 50 would be 5 millimeters. And 12 by 50 would be 4.167 millimeters. That's rounded up. If you wanted to, you could measure the exit pupil by holding the binocular up to a bright light source. Do not use the sun. And then measure the size directly. But using the formula, it should be good enough. So what does this matter to us? Well, the larger the exit pupil, the brighter the image. That's going to give us better performance in low light situations. At this point, you might be asking yourself, if that's the case, then why don't we have just massive objectives like 300 millimeters for a 10 power binocular? After all, that's a 30 millimeter exit pupil. Well, there's a couple reasons for this. First, an optical design is going to be limited by what is practical. If your objective is massive, the individual barrels of the binoculars won't be able to get close enough for you to have the appropriate IPD. Remember, that's interpupillary distance. So you won't be able to see through them. The design would have to be some type of advanced oral prism that would have to have additional prisms or lenses transmitting the light closer together as it passes from the objective end to the ocular end in order to be the appropriate width for your IPD. That sounds like very complicated and a lot of money. Second, and more importantly, it would do no good to have a 30 millimeter exit pupil because your actual pupil diameter is smaller than that. Your eye is only able to intake the width of the pupil. The average human pupil during daylight hours is two to four millimeters, and that goes to around four to eight millimeters in low or no light. It's like trying to jam a 30 millimeter pencil into a four millimeter tube. It ain't happening. That being said, something like the Fujinon 25 by 150 millimeter has a six millimeter exit pupil. Awesome. That's a lot of light transmitting possibility. However, the IPD is 60 to 70 millimeters, meaning that there's going to be a lot of people who couldn't use them, but perhaps the majority of people could. Affording them is another question, as they run about $6,500, and also not very practical, as they have to be mounted onto something very stable and likely very sturdy, as they weigh 42.99 pounds. It's about 19.5 kilograms for those people that hate freedom. I'm just kidding, guys. We've been talking millimeters this whole damn time. Fun fact. 
your pupil size will decrease with the following. Age, smoking, air contaminants, poor health, nervous eye movements, and a crappy diet. One advantage of having an exit pupil larger than your actual pupil is that it does allow more image forgiveness. Let's say your pupils contracted down to two millimeters in daylight and you're on a boat in some choppy water and your binos have a five millimeter exit pupil. This is going to allow you to keep seeing the image even though things are shifting as you don't have to have your eye perfectly aligned. Finally, that was a long preamble to get to the point of actually selecting binoculars. As you can see, there are a lot of factors that go into it. Some questions that might help you in your selection of the appropriate form factor would be, what am I using this for? What is my budget? What are the conditions I'm going to be using this in most? Am I better off buying one high-end unit or two lower cost units that are specialized for different applications? What features are important to me? Here is some advice to consider. Get a binocular with your environment in mind. If you're hunting out west where things are more open, you're likely going to want a little higher magnification, perhaps 10x or 12x. Though 12x, in my opinion, is too much to handhold unless you are super steady. Having that extra 2x of mag over the 10x does you no good if the image is so shaky you can't actually discern the details. Whereas if you have the 10x, it might appear a little further. But you're going to be stable seeming enough to get the information you need. Keep in mind that being in a store or at a trade show when your heart rate is low and you're really calm, it's going to be a big difference from hiking several miles and then experiencing an adrenaline dump when you walk over that hill and see a monster. That 12x may now seem damn near unusable and your image is going to make it seem like you drank an extra pot of coffee. Let's say you're in the Midwest hunting. Are you in dense forests or cornfields? Will you be hunting a blend of both? If you're mostly edging around cornfields, then a 10X might be a better fit. It's more open, the distances are further, and you have more light. If you're in dense forests, the distances are shorter, there's less light, and you're likely going to prefer something like an 8x42. It's going to give you a larger exit pupil to help counteract the lack of light. You won't need as much magnification because you're not looking over a vast expanse and that extra field of view will allow you to see more. Do you need a range finding capability? Maybe out west or in the cornfield scenario, depending on the actual distances, but you likely won't for dense forests. Here's a quick rundown of my thoughts on the different binocular form factors. Compact binoculars, something like an 8X or 10X by 28 millimeters or slightly larger, maybe 32 millimeters. If you're prioritizing size far more than performance, it may be a good choice, but if you're performance minded, one of the larger sizes is much better. My favorite size of binocular is 8x42. They have great exit pupil for low light performance, great field of view, just enough mag for most applications. It's also going to be smaller, about one to two inches shorter and lighter, perhaps eight to 10 ounces than uh, other optics with a 50 millimeter objective. 10 by 42 is the most popular size on the market. Though its exit pupil isn't great, it offers good all around performance. And even though eight by 42 is my favorite form factor, I must confess, I usually carry around a 10 by 42 with a built-in rangefinder. 10 by 50 is gonna be better in low light performance than the 10 by 42 but it's larger and heavier and has a touch less field of view. If FOV, size, and weight aren't factors, it may be a good choice. 12 by 50, it's gonna have a smaller exit pupil. It's gonna be larger, it's gonna be heavier, it's gonna be less field of view. It's gonna be difficult to hold steady. It's not my favorite. It's a good choice if you're using a tripod or window mount and magnification is prioritized. Larger binoculars, something like a 15 to 20x by perhaps 56 millimeter or better, 
And these can be great for observation or astronomical use or even out west spotting, though a tripod is going to be a necessity. Some people experience eye strain trying to use a spotting scope due to one eye being used, which can lead to headaches and nausea. Usually one of these larger binoculars typically solves that problem. They're large, heavy, quite costly, and they have a very specific use. I'm not a huge fan. I'm biased because the window for IPD on these models doesn't allow for me to see through them since my eyes are narrower set than the design allows for. Though these tend to be a favorite for quite a few hunters in the Southwest US. With optics, for the most part, you get what you pay for. The more you spend, the better the glass, the better the coatings. The optical system is going to be better in general. But how far is too far and what are you really getting? There is a diminishing rate of returns. Perhaps a $1,700 set of binoculars are amazing and the best you've ever seen, but they aren't the $2,400 Swaros that most people rave about. It really just depends on what you're looking for. The higher the price, the better the performance. But that diminishing rate of returns really narrows at that level. Here, the input, your hard-earned dollars, start to give you less output, meaning binocular performance. So what's it worth to you? I've seen models that are several hundred dollars cheaper than the top of the line and are almost every bit as good, perhaps a 1-3% to decrease in performance. Most people, unless you really know what you're looking for, won't even notice the difference. Do you need the cream of the crop name brand and performance? If you have the budget for it, well, why not? Can you live without that 1-3% to in which you need resolution charts and several tests in order to determine the performance gap? That's for you to decide. But hopefully you have a better knowledge base in order to do it now. As technology progresses, the performance you're getting for your money is getting better and better. Some lower level optics from today can really give some costly designs from yesteryear a run for their money or outperform them. There's a sweet spot for everyone and you're the only person who can determine where that is. Some people don't really have a discerning eye for this. If you can't tell the difference between a few hundred dollar binocular and a few thousand dollar binocular, save your money. Put it towards something else. Here's some other considerations. Warranty. If you're going to invest in nice optics, it's good to have a solid warranty. Quite a few manufacturers are switching to lifetime warranties, but not all are created equal. So you want to check and see what the catch is. Sometimes there's a catch, other times not. You can also get third-party warranties, but these can be a bit pricey and also not all are created equal. The body covering of the binoculars. A lot of binoculars these days will have a rubberized body covering, which can help with absorbing some shock if dropped and really does help to retain heat in your hands in a cold environment. A case, neck strap, shoulder strap, or bino harness. Usually the nicer the bino, the better the accessories that come with it, but that's not always the case. A zippered case may come with them, which is fine for long-term storage, but it's not great for carrying around. Usually most will come with at least a neck strap, which I don't like. It's too much forward slung weight on your neck for too long. It tends to give me headaches. I prefer having the weight on the shoulders via shoulder straps or even better, a bino harness. In my opinion, a binocular harness is the way to go. It will keep the weight on your shoulders and provide a pouch on your chest that holds your binoculars. It will also have straps to retain your binos, still allow you to bring them up to your eyes or let them hang outside of the pouch in case you see something and you need to set them down quick. If you don't have a harness, I would say it's worth the investment. Let's cover some filters and other accessories. For tactical or military use, some models you can find have what's referred to as an ARD or an anti-reflective device. This is also sometimes called a kill flash. These prevent opposition from determining your position by cutting down glint, reflection, or glare off of your objective lenses. And if you add these, it's going to cut down on the light transmission and will darken your image and also reduce your optical quality. So you need to keep that in mind. Solar filters. You can find these filters, which would allow you to more safely view an eclipse or other solar events 
flares, etc. You can also find yellow filters. These can increase visibility in haze or in low light on cloudy days. It can help with resolution and contrast. You can also find polarizing filters. These will greatly reduce glare in bright light conditions, especially on glass and water. Eyepiece and objective covers. I never use these, but they can help keep your lenses clean. Sometimes binos come with them, sometimes they don't. A tripod adapter. These usually don't come with your binoculars. Sometimes they come with the larger 15 to 20x binoculars that are tripod mounted, but an add on is sometimes worth the investment. Your binos will likely have a hinge cap, which you can remove and then affix that to the adapter. The other end will have a quarter 20 thread most of the time, which allows attachment to most tripods. This is great for long periods of glassing to help cut down on shoulder and neck fatigue. A window mount. Basically, it's a tripod adapter that lets you clamp a panhandle to your window which in turn substitutes your vehicle for the tripod. It's pretty handy. Smartphone adapter. You can get adapters to allow your cell phone camera to take pictures and video through the barrel of your binoculars or spotting scope. I really, really like the Nova grade phone adapter. I have the double gripper. It adjusts to any cell phone and has inserts to fit nearly any size eyepiece. Otherwise, you're gonna be spending quite a lot of money anytime you change your phone or your gear. Cleaning. I'm not going to go too deep here, but the cleaner you keep your optics, the better they perform. Dirty lenses can reduce the amount of light coming to your eye by 25 to 50 percent. I usually just use products that are designed for camera equipment because it's definitely going to be safe for them. But be careful what you put on your optics if you're using some homebrew cleaner. Some chemicals will damage the coatings of your optics and greatly reduce performance, and your warranty is not always going to cover that if it happens. Hopefully you found this video helpful and informative. If you're still here, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps with the algorithm, especially since YouTube is diametrically opposed to some of the other content we've put out, and they have no problem bottlenecking us because of this. Also, if you want more content, Buy our stuff! The more we sell, the more money we can throw at making cool stuff for you to watch. So there you have it. You can use that code BINOVID20 at checkout for 20% off all of our products. And on that note, that was a lot of information. Hopefully, uh, you know, he didn't fall asleep. But anyway, keep on rocking in the free world. Fuck. That was a lot of reading. A lot of talking. A lot of information. master class in optics bullshit. Alright. Time to get some lunch.